Thanks to Star Trek, we have been blessed with so many strong, strong performances across all of the various shows and films. Now, how the heck are we supposed to narrow those down to just 10? Well, don't worry about it. That's my job. And I'm going to look after that for you. I'm Sean Ferrick for Trek Culture, and here are the 10 best individual performances in Star Trek. Number 10. I call that a bargain. In the Pale Moonlight consistently ranks among the top episodes of Star Trek overall. There's any number of reasons for this, not least Avery Brooks' stellar performance as Sisko as he sinks further and further into the plot to con the Romulans. However, it's Andrew Robinson's Garrick who takes this spot. From the character's first appearance in Season 1's past prologue, Garrick had always held audiences with the mystery and danger suggested by his various backstories. With the confirmation that he was a former member of the Obsidian Order, the danger doubled, but his charm never wavered. However, it was the reveal in the climactic scene between Sisko and Garrick that truly stunned viewers. Sisko's rage at Garrick's actions are countered with the Cardassian's cold, yet accurate, assurance that the captain knew exactly what he was doing when he came to Garrick. Robinson plays the scene perfectly. In Garrick's mind, Sisko had always planned for events to unfurl as they had, and simply lied to himself to sleep at night. Garrick had no such pretensions. Robinson's furious insistence of the fact, along with listing the acceptable costs of their actions, left more than one jaw on the floor. One of the darkest moments in Star Trek, complemented by one of the great greatest deliveries from a guest star in the franchise. Number 9. Time's Up Kate Mulgrew had an unenviable task when she was cast as Captain Janeway. First, she was replacing the first actor, and then had to play catch-up on the scenes that had already been recorded. On top of this, Star Trek Voyager was the flagship show for the UPN, so the need for the success of the show led to executives standing on set judging her throughout most of the first season. She more than rose to the occasion, with Janeway quickly becoming a fan-favourite character. Therefore, picking a single performance by Mulgrew is tough. How does one choose when there are options like Endgame? Game, Pathfinder, Macrocosm, and Dark Frontier. However, Mulgrew's performance in Year of Hell manages to rise above and is perhaps the most stressful depiction of the character through the show's seven-year run. Her determination to keep the ship flying and the crew alive leads Janeway to take almost as much of a beating as the ship itself. By the time the two-parter comes to a close, the audience had seen every variation on the captain, all in the space of an hour and a half. Her efforts to destroy the Krenum timeship culminate in the grand sacrifice of ramming Voyager into the larger vessel. In a lesser actor's hands, the line of of Time's Up could have earned a very cheesy review, yet there's such an earnest honesty in Mulgrew's delivery that it's hard not to feed it as the ship explodes. Yes, there's a reset button. No, it doesn't detract from a fantastic ending. Number 8. I have been, and always shall be, Oh, come on, you knew it was coming. You may be surprised that it isn't higher on the list, but bear in mind there are 60 years of performances to judge here. Leonard Nimoy's final scenes as Spock in Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan will always rank among the most heartbreaking in the franchise, but why? Simply put, we cared and we cared hard. There was the history of the character, who at this point was almost 20 years old in the public eye. Added to this were the rumours, allegedly circulated by a disgruntled Gene Roddenberry, of the character's death before the film's release. Nimoy had a tall order going into the film, and he delivered. Spock has never been an easy character to play, as the repressed emotions within place a massive weight on the performer's shoulders. Zachary Quinto and Ethan Peck are both seriously impressive in their iterations of the character, but Nimoy's struggle to stand, the tug to straighten his uniform, and the sightless walk toward Kirk never fail to elicit tears. After all of the action and battles, after the death of Khan and the creation of a new world, Spock, the oldest character in the franchise, slumps to the ground, dying of radiation poisoning. Much praise is given to William Shatner's reaction in this scene, and for good reason, but it is Nimoy's rasping delivery of those infamous words, followed by his final live long and prosper, that rises above the rest in this film. Of all of the souls that we've met in our travels, his was the most human. Number 7. I Created It Now, for those of you who are wondering why Avery Brooks' performance from In the Pale Moonlight wasn't the one selected, this is why. And, if we're all honest with ourselves, doesn't it make sense? The portrayal of Benny Russell is simply one of the finest pieces of television acting that Star Trek has ever seen. There's so many layers to Far Beyond the Stars. There are the moments when Sisko is forced to jump between two lives, his own and Russell's. There is the reveal of his friend, Quentin Swafford's death, while he expresses his sadness to his father, played by the late, great Brock Peters. And then, seemingly from nowhere, the audience is transported to Earth in the 1950s. Star Trek had dealt with racism in the past, most notably in Let That Be Your Last Battlefield, but the struggles that Benny Russell, a struggling writer who happens to be a black man, endures in the space of 40 minutes is brutal. The episode wisely doesn't shy away from the bigotry targeted on Benny juxtaposed with the hope for a brighter tomorrow. When that hope is stripped away in Russell's final moments, the breakdown that follows is gut-wrenching to watch. Brooks, who also directs the episode, is raw, sending waves of passion and rage into every word 
injured, it is all the audience and the rest of the characters in the scene can do but to watch this man beaten down again and again finally succumb to the evil surrounding him. That the episode then ends on a more contemplative note, along with Siskel's decision to remain in Starfleet to fight the good fight, is the perfect coda to this story. Seriously, though it hardly needs to be said, Far Beyond the Stars is top tier television and stellar acting rolled into one. Number six, they were clean, Major. It should say something about the strength of Star Trek Deep Space Nine that not only are there already several performances from the show listed here already, but now we discuss one from its very first season. Any long-term fan of the franchise will know that Star Trek has a varied history with its debut seasons, but DS9 came out firing. Harris Eulen guest stars as Eamon Moritza, or is it Gold Dar Heel, in the episode Duet. When the Cardassian arrives from the station, he is immediately imprisoned by Major Kira. When questioned on this, she explains that, as the sufferer of a rare condition, he could only have con contracted it at the Galatep labour camp, the site of a brutal massacre of Bajoran civilians. What follows is a game of chess between Kira and the man, as she challenges him about his alleged crimes. When he is identified as Darheel, Yulin delivers a truly terrifying speech about how good it had felt to utterly destroy so many Bajorans, along with ordering his men to go out and kill more. He orates wildly, telling her that his men came back covered in blood, yet felt clean, because they were clean. Kira can only stare at him, horrified, to then have the character switch, once it is revealed revealed that he is not, in fact, Darheel, but Maritza, who had been a filing clerk at the camp, from a proud war criminal to a broken, devastated victim, is horrific. Yulin as Darheel was frightening, but Yulin as Maritza is truly crushing. He breaks down, confessing he altered his appearance in the hope that the execution of Darheel might give the Bajorans a sense of closure. Kira releases him, unable to face another innocent death in the occupation's legacy. The senseless murder of Maritza mere moments later only compounds the message that hate is both destroyed destructive and pointless. Number five, Sarek. Patrick Stewart was given a very tall order in the episode Sarek. Here, he must go first head to head with Mark Leonard, one of the original stars of Star Trek, a man who originated the Romulans and, of course, played Spock's father. The episode shows the man succumbing to the rigors of Vulcan old age, named here as Bendy Syndrome. As there are crucially important negotiations to take place, Sarek's wife, Perrin, requests that he and Picard mind meld. This would give Sarek all of Picard's emotional control, though it would leave Picard with Sarek's turmoil. So begins a painful scene to watch. Stewart is fantastic, playing the ageing Vulcan even as he remains in the guise of Picard. He cries out for Perrin, for Amanda, and indeed for Spock. Tears stream down his face as he decries the pain of ageing. It's a brutal scene to watch, though it's one of the many, many examples of Stewart's gift to Star Trek. Number four, a Vulcan's comfort. Frequent followers of Trek culture will know that, where possible, we'll shower Jolene Blaylock with praise for her portrayal of T'Pol. The challenges that she faced both on and off screen ought to justify that alone, yet there are still those individual moments that rise above the rest. The development of her character, particularly in the third and fourth seasons, allowed Blaylock to infuse more emotion into T'Pol, not too dissimilar to the journey that Spock went on. As the audience had come to understand her and her feelings, yes, feelings, for Trip, the story of demons and Terra Prime truly hit hard. Elizabeth is their cloned child, created without their knowledge and is being used as a bargaining tool by human extremists. One could almost ignore the rest of the episodes, despite their strength, and look to the final final moments between T'Pol and Trip on board Enterprise. Elizabeth was cloned without an understanding of the differences between human and Vulcan physiologies, and this leads to her death. While both parents had only known of her existence for a short time, they are devastated. Of course, the audience is expecting Trip to show his emotions, but it's T'Pol's struggle to keep her composure with him, taking his hand and gripping it hard that stands out most. Sometimes it isn't the big speeches or even the quiet whispers that make us feel something so raw. This simple gesture would have been unimaginable between T'Pol and anyone else in the first couple of seasons yet there is a dreadful, yet at the same time heartwarming, feeling that passes over the audience. The scene is the very definition of bittersweet, and Blaylock turns in the last great performance of Star Trek Enterprise. Number three, for my father, who's coming home, Tony Todd. Tony Todd. Todd first joined Star Trek in The Next Generation's third season episode, Sins of the Father, appearing as Kern, Worf's younger brother. While he was fantastic in the part, it's his portrayal of Jake Sisko that never fails to shatter Trekkies with even the stoniest of hearts. Throughout The Visitor, Todd's sometimes calm, sometimes heartbroken portrayal of a man trying to come to terms with the shocking death of his father dominates every scene. While Siroc Lofton originates the role of Jake, there's simply no better person to appear in the final scene between old Jake and Ben, smiling at each other in the early morning sunshine. 
sunshine. As Jake's tears fall from Todd's eyes and he dies in Ben's company, his joy radiates through the scene. The poison he has taken has done its job. Avery Brooks also impresses, again, with his horror at Jake's actions, and Jake's death will reset time to rights. But the reveal that Jake finally did start writing again, dedicating his final work to his dad, and his excitement to see him again, is enough to break us all. The episode hits differently for everyone, and particularly those who have lost a parent, but one thing that is universal is the power of Tony Todd here. While he would return again later that season, donning the Klingon ridges once more, it's old Jake Sisko who will always take this writer's heart with him. Tony Todd, bloody hell. Number two, you Klingon bastard. William Shatner often received criticism for his portrayal of Captain Kirk in the original series. While there certainly are some moments and scenes that have aged better than others, one shouldn't be so quick to forget performances like Balance of Terror and The City on the Edge of Forever. In these two examples alone, Shatner more than proves he's got what it takes to show range. When looking at the deaths that hit Kirk the hardest, it would be easy to go with Shatner's performance in the wake of Spock's death. That lip wobble during the funeral scene is etched into the audience's memory like it's carved in stone. Yet it's actually a moment from the following film that ranks here. Star Trek III The Search for Spock is proof enough that the old statement, odd numbers bad, even numbers good, is nonsense. Admiral Kirk leads his crew to stealing the Enterprise in easily one of the most fun scenes of the movie franchise. Their arrival at Genesis and subsequent attack by the Klingons turns that on its head. Kruge's away party executes one of the science team on the planet, the scientist who created the Genesis device with his mother, Kirk's son, David Marcus. Admiral, says Savick, David is dead. Shatner takes a moment, he steps back, where one assumes he means to sit in the captain's chair. Instead, he stumbles and hits the deck hard. Shock radiates from him in waves, which we feel through the screen. This is Admiral Kirk. He doesn't lose, yet here he is. His best friend is dead, his son is dead, and knowing he is facing yet another loss in the form of the Enterprise herself. Honestly, if it's been a while, go back and watch Star Trek 3 again. It alone will be proof enough to remind everyone that yes, William Shatner could act, and well. Number one, I could die tomorrow. I don't know if I'm ready to face that. Deep Space Nine could easily make an entire list of these, and with entries like this one, it's not hard to see why. It's only a paper moon took the reality of war and brought it home, leading on from the events of the siege of AR 558, in which fan favourite character Nog lost his leg in the course of duty. Aaron Eisenberg simply stuns here. Nog returns to the station, leaning on a cane for support, quieter now, less eager to go into battle. He reverts further and further into himself before he finds a new lease of life in Vic Fontaine's lounge in the Hollow Suite. While there, he throws himself into his new project, slowly building walls against the outside world as he does. Things seem to be going well, though it's just another expression of his trauma. When finally confronted by Vic himself, Nog lets his fear out, breaking down at a admitting how terrified he is. If he could lose a leg, then why not his life the next time he's sent into battle? The episode has rightfully received much acclaim for its depiction of PTSD, but it's Eisenberg's task to make that come to life. He took every word of it and handed in the finest performance of his career, and one of the strongest of any actor in the franchise. The episode will always stand as a tribute to the man, and yet another example of incredible acting in Star Trek. And that's everything for our list today, folks. Do you agree with our ranking? Let us know in the comments below. And of course, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Now remember, you can catch us over on Twitter at Trekcult, you can catch myself at Sean Ferrick on Twitter as well. Make sure that you live long and prosper till I see you again. Make sure that you are good to yourself and good to others. To our friends in Ukraine, stay strong. We love you. Have a wonderful time, everyone. Make it so.